Hey, good morning. Hey, Mike. Hey, Chris. Let's do a cold open, shall we? And figure out where we're going. This is what Andy does now. He just he just hits record and go, so we're going. I don't feel like doing an intro no. or anything. The cold open is, is like, it it's, does require go a bit to, of Okay, it. sorry, Chris. Sorry. It works Hello, for and welcome Night to Live. another edition of the Agile Uprising podcast. Drum roll, please. This is a panel show. We have some extra seats for you listeners, but don't call in because this is pre-recorded. Uh, I'm here, no, on my left, my right, video is mirrored, so this is confusing and it's early. So Mike Caudell is here on one of my sides and Chris Merman. Good morning, gentlemen. Morning, y'all. Oh, my God. Right. That was even better than I thought it would be. So let's jump right into the Sargassum Sea. Um, Merman, you and I were talking earlier this month about simplification and complication, and somehow we swam into a mess of seaweed that we called organizational debt. And so that's that, the- that we're that we're calling it now. Like we're again, I have done all the googling to try to figure out if anybody has crafted this terminology already, and that like there have been some sort of kind of attempts, but. I, 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 we're paving new territory with this conversation and it like, there's a lot of, there, there's a lot of fertile ground here that has not been fully, fully defined yet. Right. So like, I'm, I'm, I'm confused, Chris, are we paving over it or are we digging it up and making it fertile? We'll figure but, it out. Listeners. Stay I, tuned. Have I mixed metaphors already? Already. Absolutely. Jeez. Okay. Wow. I need to wake up. I am so sorry. So I did um, some Googling too, and I did some chat GBTing and it, and it, it told me the, uh, the brain in the cloud said somewhere in the early 2000s, um, the term came up in organizational management circles. Mike, what's your experience? And then we'll, we'll do a toss up. Who, who wants to take a stab at a starting, a working definition. Mike, you, you, you kick us off. Like, what what have you found? What I what I found, I've not found any um, academic basis for it. My perspective is all experiential, and it the, the term organizational debt came up in some work I was doing earlier this year as um, decisions and processes and roles that um, persist beyond their usefulness, largely because of reluctance to get rid of them. And it, the analogy to credit card debt or technical debt was uh, kind of uh, jumped off the page at us. Yeah. And I got thinking about it and we'll get into that later, but yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you. I, the, the, the oldest article I could find was in Forbes in 2015 written by Steve Blank. Organizational debt is like technical debt, but worse. Like that's the main, the main lens that people view organizational debt is basically like the human version of tech debt, which is not a terrible definition. I just wonder if that, like, that's why I feel like that, that still feels like scratching the surface to me. Right, mm -hmm. Andy? Yeah. So I, I read Steve Blank's article too, and he was looking at it in the context of startups and venture capitalists and exactly. scale ups. And then a, a couple of other people picked it up a few years later. Um, I found an article by Aaron Dignan. Sorry if I've garbled your last name, wouldn't be an Agile Uprising podcast if we didn't screw up name pronunciations. <laughs> um, the interest companies pay when their structure and policies stay fixed and or accumulate as the world changes around them. I love that. That, that gets a Back little bit, a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. um, there was another one. Um, Chris, I think you pointed this one out. You, you can garble this person's name uh, from 2019. Uh, which article is that? Bulent Duagi. Oh my Duagi. gosh. Bulent. I'm um, glad you tried reading it, not me. Organizational debt is a result of all the decisions and actions that should have been done to ensure an organization is operating at peak health and efficiency. That's right. But weren't. 
and, and so, it's an accumulation of micro drifts between what's needed and what is. And that that refers to that refers to transformational efforts that should have been done but weren't. That doesn't revert. That doesn't like again that. I feel like if I were a, a more experienced tech coach, right? I am I am I have I've worked with some really great ones, but I would not consider myself one. That doesn't scratch the surface of what we consider technical debt is. Technical debt is the residue, right, in inside a code base of too much code being written and it needs to be cleaned up a bit. Mike, go ahead. <clears throat> so Connecting both of those ideas, what's occurring to me is the accumulation of organizational micro drifts. Um, those micro drifts can come from a number of places. So when uh, when new new process change things like that happen, there's some pruning and realigning or or changing or moving process and people and roles. That needs to happen that doesn't and then also just there's um as people as an organization develops and matures and grows in its capability you need sometimes less of what you have and sometimes you need more or different so i want to circle back end, a minute to that mike about where it comes from and what we do with it but chris you raised the topic and, and mike you said earlier financial debt credit card debt or one of you said that in technical debt um, so was it Ward Cunningham, 1982 talked, he coined technical debt and he said, use properly. It's good. It helps with growth and expansion and rapid experimentation. And so short-term debt is useful. Does that apply in the world of organization and transformation? Can it be useful in the short term, but dangerous if it's not addressed in the long term? So, all right, let's tease this out, right? So what we're talking, you're, you're saying if we get in a regular practice of identifying, right? So you could say retrospectives is a good use of short-term organizational debt at a smaller scale because we just did it, right? Two weeks ago, we just experienced these things that we're feeling. We can do something about it, Um I, I I agree that that is a good practice. I I still feel like if that happens organization wide, there's not the um I worry that that's not enough that what industry wide I've seen, Mike. So like the experience that you've seen, Mike, that's not seemingly cutting it in practice alone, right? My lived experience has been that um, technical debt and organizational debt uh, share a characteristic in that it's like many people misuse uh, financial or credit card debt. Um, unhealthy organizations misuse technical debt and organizational debt. As Ward Cunningham originally defined and imagined this, this was um, intentional, deliberate, short term making a taking a um short term pain to learn or get to something uh some different outcome but then going back and cleaning that up in a reasonable time and not losing sight of it my lived experience has been that many organizations uh accumulate it without um being that deliberate and then it builds up and and starts to collapse under its own weight. Yeah, it's like uh, financial credit sense. card debt, right? Uh, yeah. Eventually, the the weight expands exponentially. Compound interest is not our friend in either of these debt cycles. Let's let's go back to something you touched on, Mike. Um, where it comes from? You talked about decision making, policies, role definitions. <clears throat> Excuse me. What what are some other sources? of not tech debt or financial debt, but what we're talking about, organizational debt, these micro drifts. Um, it could be, my, my experiences have been, it can be regulatory things. And um, uh, I've worked in a couple banks. You have uh, audit uh, function. And 
um, due to regulations, um, there's practices that get instilled, and then uh, there's uh, hesitancy to update those practices as um, new understandings of what might be a valid audit function or a valid compliance function occur, as one example. Um, uh, just uh, the another kind of lived experience has been that uh, one organization I was part of, as we became more capable, we were reluctant to let go of processes. They were like our whoopee because we didn't want to let go of them because we felt comfortable with them. Uh, Andy, Chris, that's... what's your what's what's your experience? Yeah, well, no, I, I was I was going to toss it to Andy because Andy, we we see that like th this idea of a pet, like a pet process, a pet a pr pet practice, a pet. You know, hey, I just got certified in X framework, X scaling framework that I think is really going to be the next thing. I'm not calling any frameworks out because, again, this conversation is not about blaming frameworks. Like these are organizational decisions that are made by leadership. And then they think, all right, I'm good. Let's do this. I'm good. And we're going to either stick with it or we're going to, it's like, we, we get dogmatic about that, but we get very flexible about all the other little things that need to be done in order to make that decision successful. I, I, I personally think that organizational debt is a, it, it's a lack of attention, right? Just like technical debt is a lack of attention to the fact that we have written a junk ton of code and we haven't cleaned anything up. And we think, well, but our coding practices are going to be such that we don't really write ourselves into a huge tech debt hole because we're just, we have good practices to begin with. We have code reviews. We have this, we have that, we have the UAT process, we have the whatever, right? We have production fixes if we need to, if, if there's it like, it almost is like we haven't had enough production issues in the organizational debt area to force us to kind of address it, except when layoffs occur or whatever and stuff. Right, Andy? Or attrition, right? And and so um, I'm making a note, you know, what are, what are the indicators? But uh, before we get there, so it comes from these micro drifts. Um, doing the easy thing now um, instead of the right thing which when you're writing code sometimes is gets you to find out if your hypothesis is correct. But Mike, sure. you talked about um, these things and, and I'm gonna put them into these two buckets. Let's explore it. Chris, you and I were talking in prep, obsolescence and accumulation. Micro drifts of obsolescence. Uh, so go back to um, a highly regulated industry, Mike. Um, do we ever take out the policies? So accumulation of policies in itself is not bad, provided they're relevant. But if they're obsolete, what happens? They just it's, stick it's around. A, yeah, it's a combination, a deadly combination of obsolescence and accumulation and kind of reaching back to the um, conversation that, that y'all had a couple of weeks ago on simplification as policies, practices, roles accumulate, there comes the opportunity for simplification as well. And uh, to Chris's point, it takes effort and focus and um, and, uh, and discipline to really make that happen. And, it's... and, and to be, to, to like have a glass half full approach, mm -hmm. the, uh, these drifts that you all are talking about are most are I mean almost all of the time well-intended decisions that an organization makes to optimize the humans that are making things or or managing the people that are making things yeah. to to their very best right like we th they don't say I'm gonna you know here in Q3. I'm gonna put an organizational you know a, a, a drift. Like I'm going to make a decision that's going to drift us off course. Like we don't think in that terms, like we, you know, I, and I don't think that either of you are suggesting that. I just, I just want to be very clear, like leadership is doing their damn best 
You know yes. what I mean? Like we, 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 it's, it's fun on LinkedIn to make fun of leadership and management meme in memes and, and, and jokes and videos and stuff, but like, we're all doing our best, but yet you can't make decisions over time without it accumulating mm -hmm. a little bit. It, it stacks up and eventually like you need to kind of clean it up a bit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's very normal and natural and it's a, uh... You know, much like if if you had you know a, a garden, you've got to tend it every so often and you know pull out some things and um, yeah, it's it, just to um, uh, acknowledge what you were just saying, Chris. Um, being a, a leader in an organization is hard work. <laughs> oh, I see. You know, just yeah. it's hard. So you know, there are should... so many Incredible. impacts. Um, and, and I'm wondering why it's not addressed more readily, right? So we've talked about decisions, roles, structures, processes, the human impact, um, both in culture, attracting, retaining uh, talent. So the, the consequences of not addressing technical debt become obvious. You can measure it. You see things slow down flexibility and it eventually it comes to a halt um why does it matter to leadership what are some of the implications of leaving it uh underdressed if i if i could uh, add an observation to the end of that statement andy uh the uh, the impacts and the evidence become evident over time but um when you're when you're in it every day, it's harder to see and recognize the impacts and then to prioritize addressing um, a accumulation of micro drifts versus whatever uh, initiative or, or mini crisis is taking those leaders focus at that moment. So where I, that, that's my, my lived experience has been, it's, it slowly accumulates and it's not easy to, to recognize. One of the most powerful ways of recognizing it is giving it a name. Is mm -hmm. it talked about in your lived experience, Mike? No, absolutely not. Absolutely. So you 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 talk about recognizing it and seeing it. I like I feel we're still in this weird territory. I, I mean, you know, tech debt's been around for how many decades? And you, you still have you still have, I mean, it's almost like climate change. Some people just don't acknowledge that it exists. And I, and you say, well, you know, that's a real thing. Yes, I'm saying it's a real thing, but we don't struggle with that in our organization, right? That's what you hear a lot of leaders say is that's not a huge issue for us. Well, it's not an issue for you right now because you don't have a production issue lighting your hair on fire. Um, so of course you don't feel any pain right now, but that doesn't mean that it's not there. I I I feel like organization. I feel like we are just by trying to talk about it. We are we are speaking about something that's almost in the ether. That's almost intangible. That finding a way to make it tangible for people is just like tech debt. It's one of the hardest parts of the job. Once they see it, they can't unsee it, right? But it's very difficult to like shove the dog's nose in the face of it to to say you did this in the house brother like this is this is something that's on your watch yeah. we got to do something about it right yeah yeah maybe I mean, yeah yeah no it make, makes a lot of sense and i offer the uh belief and hypothesis that one of the factors that makes it difficult for leaders and, and organizations as a whole to recognize it is because it's related to human beings, to people. And there's a, a very strong uh, aversion to saying, you, you know, you're not doing the, the thing that we need to do at the moment until there's a, until it's not hard because of layoffs or whatever. Or well, there's layoffs, and then uh, what was it earlier last year? The the, the quiet quitting uh, mm -hmm. syndrome showed up. Yeah, right. Yeah, and now we've got if if you believe the popular press, there's quiet firing happening. If you 
you want to go down that path. <laughs> I mean, organizations are biting back this year. I, I yeah. you know, but they, that's yeah. been the last year and a half, I guess, yeah. to to a degree yeah. with the economy re- rebounding. We, you know, we somehow again we're we're still feeling the reverberations of covid so all right so andy we've got like we've got attrition we've got the, the this is also like trying to measure change fatigue like it's it's like the number of times that people say change fatigue is almost the measure of change fatigue like um <laughs> or just the amount of times people say the word change in a meeting is almost an a, a, a you know and you're like how is that a metric like it kind of is if you jump into every single meeting and people talk about being tired of all the change, that just means that you're asking people to do a bunch of things they don't want to do, right? So that that there there is a residue in that, right? That with every single departure of the organization, and the smaller your organization, the more you're going to feel every single departure, right? Every new vendor that comes in and out, like it can be with it can be with vendors, not even full timers, right? Uh, people definitely every new leader that comes in there's going to be a residue, right? And if you change leadership often, oh, you got about you got a lot of residue on your hands, you know what I mean? Like what what Andy, what else in your mind do you think of as as indicators? Well, well, I'm just my my mind drifted back to the analogy of tech debt and financial debt. So eventually with tech debt, either um the new feature factory grinds to a halt because you can't pile anything else on top of what you've got. And somebody says, we, we got to greenfield it. We got to, you know, build it from scratch new. Uh, financial debt, eventually, you know, you go bankrupt. Um, what happens eventually with org debt? And and does it become so traumatic, just like uh, greenfield or bankruptcy? Uh, what happens? Wow. I, I, I think we see... If organizations could measure, they can, if they would measure innovation, Mm -hmm. if they would measure better customer satisfaction, employee satisfaction, I think um, this organizational debt issue would be more visible. I can offer some other metrics that might point towards organizational debt. Um, Decision latency. How long does yes. it take to make a decision? Um, shout, uh, reach back to and shout out to Peter Merrill and the Xscale work. Doer, decider, distance. What's the distance between doers and deciders? And cousin to that is the doer-decider ratio. How many doers to deciders do you have? If you have um, more, dis- you know, proportionately uh, more uh deciders than doers, mm, you know, that might be an indication. If there, the distance between the doer and the decider is greater, that might be an indication. Yeah, and, and I feel you, like Jeff Foxworthy here. I love it. Um, and, and I'm going back to Tet debt. So for, for a while, there was bug bounty, right? Find the mm-hmm. bugs in the code base, you get a bounty, you have a backlog, you build it, right? Um, but you could get flow metrics on on the bugs. What if there was a backlog of organizational debt? What if it was safe um, mm. and there was, a, there was a team empowered to make changes and there was a debt backlog and you measured flow metrics on it? Mm. Would you expose all the stuff you just talked about, Mike? Yeah, po- possibly. <laughs> it's an interesting idea that I'd love to see uh that you're, you're calling out something that um, I would say that Agilists have called for for years of there being a leadership position that's devoted to like just hunting and finding those types of things. And because a lot of organ, let, I mean, let's let's be let's be real, right? We have to do a lot with not enough people, and it doesn't matter the size of your organization. It's just the scope of what's being asked of that group of individuals is just bigger when you have a lot more people. So if, you, if you're thinking like, oh, if I worked at a Fortune 50 company, I would have enough people in my organization where I could I could hunt this stuff down. No, you just have more scope, right? Like you just have more work to do, the more people you have yeah. and you never have. And it's and they would say, well, adhering to those sort of like, Andy, you mentioned doing the easy thing versus the right thing. Like 
I think everything is the right thing when I'm doing it. And, <laughs> and only, only in the aftermath do I realize I just took an easy, I took an easy path to, to something quick, or you think, oh, I can get away with it this one time or this whatever, right? I, this is not something that you can see in real time. Like this is unfortunately tech debt is not something you don't realize you're writing tech debt when you're writing the code or making the architectural decisions or the, the vendor decisions you're making. You don't realize that when you set up teams this way, you're creating extra handoffs or extra dependencies or whatever. You don't realize you're doing this until after the fact you have to be dedicated to looking back going, what debt have I created in my organization that we now have to deal ourselves out of? Like that is a discipline that is not for the faint of heart, right? Right. Yeah. And it's invisible, much like a lot of knowledge work is invisible. I, I want to come back to, uh, I think something Andy was just saying about, uh, or uh, floating out the idea of what if you had an executive who was uh, charged with uh hunting down and and uh, uh, improving or organizational debt right um kind of a one part of that appeals to me then there's also uh, a different uh, thought coming to mind is if you make it one person's job then it's just if it, is there the danger of it just becoming that person's job and not becoming you know in in systemic across the organization. Um, yeah, I think it is an executive leadership type role or an agile leadership role uh, that's team-based, right? But but tying it back to measurable business outcomes mm -hmm. that executives care about, mm -hmm. innovation, customer sat, market responsiveness, employee engagement um, could be a lever and then, over, uh, and a lot mm -hmm. of them are, are lagging indicators, but I think over time, just like when you retire technical debt, you can see um, feature release quality and cadence improve. I'm wondering um, what, the, what the lag time is for reduction of org debt and improvements that you might see. I mean, it's, it, Mike, Mike was talking about the version that Mike was talking about is a, a a more focused look at you know lead time, right? I mean that there 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 are there are metrics that are created that that we could use. I, I I'm still waiting for the right org that fully embraces lead. You know, all measuring everything from the amount of time it takes to refactor and our ideas and refine our ideas and get them you know, properly articulated at, at a, at a, at an initiative or, you know, mega, mega theme, epic level, whatever you want to call, I don't care, right? Like the amount of time it takes to develop that idea before it gets into the hands, like that is, it's almost like the front time of lead time is what the, the genesis of org debt comes from, right? Like we, we are the time it takes to make a decision, the time it takes to figure out how we're going to build it and why we're going to build it and how long our funding process takes, how long our, um, how long it takes to get people organized around it, how many people are we going to utilize, how many, you know, I mean, the, all of that are just is nibbling around the edges of what that this debt that we're talking about is, because if you have, you know, it, this is the fourth framework that we've used you know in the in the seven years that i've been here or you know we used to do things this way and we used to release code this way and oh the person that wrote that stuff is no longer here anymore the person that the the or the leader that came up with that decision left the organization 18 months ago like we hear these statements all the time and yet we we don't go you know there's like there's like film like on all of this that just feels nasty and it and it makes people like you can see it on their faces when back when we used to see each other in the hallways all the time i'm i'm now starting to see people more and more and i love it right but like that shows up right yeah just like in other fields of of creative knowledge work practices emerged to, to do their best to throttle back the amount of debt incurred. 
for sure. Pair, pair programming, ensemble mobbing, all that stuff got rid of the wait time for a pull request and blah, 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 CICD. Um, are there strategies we could put some trial balloons out there for our listening audience um, as coaches, as leadership support uh, folks that, I hope that are parallel or adjacent to these technical practices that came up in software dev over the last decade. Yeah. One of, one of the coaches I learned the most from when I was a wee bitty little coach guy, um, he was adamant about everything we did, we paired and then we didn't need approval taken just what you were saying, Andy, taken right from the, um, from the, from the technical world. Um, uh, something that, that I've done in, in occasions when I need, felt the need to make a point was would calculate the cost of a meeting and just ask, do we all need to be here because this is costing us this much? Um, look at, uh, in one specific case, I wished I could have done this more often, but did it once in a, for, for a period of time is um, calculated how long it took to make decisions mm -hmm. and then just made that visible back to, to the leadership team that I was working with. The uh, bringing uh, awareness to the, the flow, kind of to, to Chris's point, uh, I'll, I'll offer is a, a place to start. And this is indeterminate. There's, there's not a cookbook to, to follow because every organization, every network of human interactions is going to be different and it's going to evolve. You, you know, Andy, you and I years ago talked about organizational silence, that that white paper that you you funneled mm -hmm. my way that that we've both written and podcasted about in the past. There, that does seem to, in my mind, resonate with this topic of debt in the organization, because if you if you have an org that people don't feel empowered or able to speak up. Um, then you're not going to, it's going to be almost impossible to make this. This is something that's hard to make tangible anyways. And if you add in the fact that I can't speak up or say anything that, that adds to, it's almost like it adds to the debt. So a, if you could measure how much people speak up, right? Like that's, that's a, that's a measure, right? I, if you could, uh, another thing is, is, uh, you talked about meetings, Mike, like when's the last time you, what if we had to end every meeting with on a scale of one to 10, how productive was this meeting? Right. And if you're the, if you're the, if you're the manager that's organizing these meetings and people are like, man, this was a waste of my time. Like that's feedback. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's almost like, but again, that goes back to organizational silence that like, how is that going to be yeah. received? You know, yeah. if you sense. if you said like, when's the last time we did a lean coffee or a retro or anything, and then we did something with it? Like, when's the last time we actually put one of our retro items as an or like program wide, enterprise wide, organization wide, whatever? When's the last time we did that and then actually did the thing as opposed to just talking for an hour and then hanging up? I'm I'm wondering. So going back to silence and tying these two together. Um, micro changes, micro shifts that accumulate begin to feel like scar tissue. Um, it was a paper cut and we went to the ER. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's overreaction to situations that are unlikely to happen again. Mike, you talked about meetings. Oh, Chris didn't find out something blew up. Great. Now we have a meeting every week that Chris has to be there so that this <laughs> never happens again. Yeah. And and yeah. we never Aim. expect and adapt, right? And Chris is too afraid to speak up to say, this is wasting my time. That was a one-off paper cut. I, I didn't lose a finger, an arm, uh, something like that. I, oh I don't gosh. know how we get out of that um, <clears throat> other than feedback loops, Um some sort of consent in participatory governance, not consensus, which is, yeah. you know, who who has the most staying power, but consent. Yeah, I have an objection or I have a concern. Let's address it. I just had a flashback to when I was, I was leading, 
project teams at the digital mobile digital studio worked at years ago. I, I remember having um, everything like the client was happy, like project was going well, app was in great condition. All things were fine. Well, something blew up at like on like a late Thursday or a Friday or something. And the client wasn't in office or it was difficulty it, it, there was like a delay in me communicating it to the client and then client got really pissed and talked to my boss and everything about it. Well, then all of a sudden, every Friday, I had to send a status of what we did. And it was one of the most detailed, researched, long <laughs> ass emails I've ever like. And it, I wrote it every single Friday. Was I was my boss wrong for asking me to do that? Not necessarily, but I basically every Friday it was like, you will not mess up this thing ever again. And I wasn't writing code. <laughs> I wasn't writing code. And yet something broke and something happened. And there was a slight delay in the communication. You know what? I never delayed in communicating anything again, because I was shamed in writing those stupid Friday status emails that <laughs> was a, nobody read and was a waste of time. It was basically a giant CYA. Yeah. And I, I, I feel shame. That reminds me of a story, and I don't know where it came from. Listener, if this is one of yours, uh, let me know. Um, they were doing a similar weekly or monthly report, and they were sure nobody was reading it. So on Monday at the, you know, the the scrum, you know, did you get my report? Yep. Um, did cover everything you needed? Yep. Okay. Any questions? No. Nope. So the following week, they sent the same exact report. Any questions? No. The following week, they started to introduce recipes of what they were planning to cook for dinner. You know, the batch on Sunday. Uh, any questions? Nope. And then the following Friday, they stopped sending it. Something along those lines. Um, we're coming up on our end of time. Gentlemen, is there anything else you'd like to add before we close out? Maybe a question, uh, a line of attack, some fishing poles that we've dumped into the water that could pull up some gems. Go for it, Mike. <clears throat> so uh, to the, back to the point that uh, Chris was, Chris was on about uh, something happens and then there's this reaction. Um, cadenced regularly occurring meetings and activities are one of the prime sources of organizational debt. So a practical tip for, for our listening audience is if you feel the urge to set one, something like that up, a process or a meeting, pause, or if you do set it up for a, sh don't set it up to recur till the end of the year, set it up for a month. And then um, a practice that I've gotten into is about once a month, I go through and look at my calendar at recurring meetings and, you know, decide maybe I don't need to be in this or we don't need to have this anymore. And if you listen to the subtle um, cues from your participants, you'll see you, you'll, it'll become clear when those are not no longer serving you. Yeah. Uh, and um, at the end of the day, organizational debt comes down to uh, human beings and human interactions. And mm -hmm. um, under, un, you know, uh, giving some grace to your fellow human understanding you know, that uh, they're coming from maybe a little different place and just you know, um, talk about it and um, try to, you know, inch by inch create uh, a space where you can have those kind of discussions. And um, this is not made big swipes. This is a game of inches. So incremental little bits will, will, uh, will likely help. And yeah. Uh, that's well said, Mike. Like my it, favorite is if someone says, "We've always done it this way." My first reaction is, "All right, fine, stop. We're not doing that anymore." <laughs> I. Uh, the, it's 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 neat that what you said, Mike, about finding a way to just like inch your way forward. I mean, I what I would love. I, I'm my my closing thought is is just to call out to the community and people that you know. I don't know that this, I think there are more stories of this, this debt, this residue, this film that we're talking about, that's really hard to quantify. 
right? Like I, I think one, my only goal in continuing this conversation and Andy, I feel like you would agree is that we, we, this needs to be more prescient, right? More in our face about discussing it because the amount of change that we go through is rapidly increasing yeah. um, to the point that if we don't start addressing this residue and find a way to quantify it, I, I don't know how to yet. I, I'm not an expert in this in any way, shape or form. I just know that it needs to be talked about. Um, I, th there's got to be something to it. Like uh, if we paired this thing with this thing, if we paired lead time with or decision latency or this with this in a way it would make it more relevant to a leader or maybe you know a story of I showed these metrics or this survey or this to a leader and that allowed them to see something that needed to be done like I, I think that's the stage that we're at right now is that this that's this needs to be fleshed out more right mm -hmm. and so I, I'm I'm asking for you all's help so that we can all become experts together because it's something we all need to be an expert in, whether we like it or not. Like whatever becomes of our industry in the future, like this is going to be part of it. You know what I mean? So so seeing it and and understanding it for what it is is so crucial, right, Andy? Yeah. So that's a great place to close. Thank you, Mike Caldell and Chris Merman for being on the panel. Listening audience, we have extra seats in our recording booth. Uh, if you'd like to join the conversation, meet us over on our Discord channel. We'll put the link in the show notes where you can share your stories about the residue uh, that you're swimming in. And maybe collectively we can come up with some ideas on how to reduce organizational debt. Finally, uh, support from listeners just like you and you and you. Uh, help us cover our podcast and hosting costs see the show notes for ideas and details about how you can become a patron at certain price points. Jay will send you a small envelope or a large box of swag. That's it. Uh, until next time, the Agile, Od the Agile Oddcast is signing out. <laughs> <laughs> My coffee pot is empty. All right. We'll hit pause, but we'll keep recording because, you know, the after conversation is always so fun. Yeah. Yeah. That um we've always done it that way is I, I just I get triggered so bad on that. Oh man. I could tell. Oh make it visible, give it a name, see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I I that's why these more that like so Mike, this started with just I, I was trying to feel around in the dark for like, can we talk about simplification and simplicity? Mm -hmm. And, and we, we stumbled upon this org debt thing and I still think we're not done feeling this out. I think we need, yeah. like, I think the next piece is like, I got to find an expert. I got to find someone that's managed to make this tangible for someone before and figure out like what it is so that we can put some meat on the bone of this conversation. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to keep like, or maybe it's a different conversation with, a different panel. I, I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, we don't have to have an answer right now. I just, I, it, whenever we talked about this last time, this, like, I felt like this tuning fork inside of me, just like get like dinged. And all of mm -hmm. a sudden I'm like, I feel something yeah. here. Like this, 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 this rings true. Right. Yeah. yeah I'm drawn to wanting to actually to, to experiment with it in real life. I, I think yeah. the consequences of it in real life, we experience every single day, week, month, quarter, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, yeah. I think the giving it a name and making it visible is going to be the first key steps. Solving it, that's a whole nother thing. You need people with uh, influence and tenure long enough to address decades of accumulated decisions, roles, et cetera. It, it impacts finance, HR, not just technology. Uh, yep. and these, these are big, risky things to change at enterprise scale. Yeah. And to your point earlier, Andy, when you find that person with influence, there has to be a cogent case that ties this 
desired action to something that that person cares about and is willing to take the risk for. Yeah. And it, I'm, it kind of visited by the thought that what we're grappling with here is much like any other, uh, any sort of transformational effort in that um, it happens one conversation, one person, one team, one organizational unit at a time and um, becomes like a katamari and it kind of builds up over time. But, but it's got to have connected tissue across all those conversations that go mm -hmm. back to an overarching vision mm -hmm. or a strategy or a goal, or it's yeah. just going to dissipate yeah, given, absolutely. given yeah. um, the, the pace that we're operating and the business pressure that everybody's under every day to, to make a decision now yeah. uh, or not make a decision. Either, yeah. either extreme yeah. is problematic. Not making a decision is making a decision. Yeah. Delayed decisions, analysis, paralysis, rocking the boat. All, yeah. all yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm in between client engagements at the moment, but in, in the next, next one, I am kind of motivated to do some experimentation with this. You know, kind of along the lines of what you were talking about, Andy. Just name it and in a kind of lightweight fashion, make it visible and see what kind of reaction it gets and. Yeah, that, that's really all and respond. Yeah, that's all we're doing right now is like, all right, now, so we've given it like organizational debts, kind of what we've settled on for right now. It's the closest thing we found to other references outside of this conversation. So, all right, cool. We kind of feel like we've sort of got a definition, like now we're validating it. And then like, how do you see it? How have you not seen it? Yep. How do we get people to see it? I, I, you know, I, it was, it was sort of, you know, I threw out the climate change thing just to kind of be witty and stuff, but like getting people to recognize like, Hey, this is a thing and you kind of need to do something about it. It like it, I, I, that's kind of where we're at. Yeah. You need to care. All right, gentlemen. Thank you. This has been a pleasure. Thanks yeah. for the extra postscript here and we'll see yeah. you along the road. See you over at discord. Okay. Bye guys.